I am interested in is to use machine learning, start from a large material candidates or crystal candidates that you would then screen with a DFT calculation to find thermodynamically stable crystal structures. And I mean, there are actually a lot of databases already available for this, such as materials project and OQMD with both of which it has um, <clears throat> several hundred thousand structures already calculated. However, a problem with this approach of only doing DFT is that it's generally very slow or, or quite slow. So you can take several hours to calculate the a property for a single crystal structure. So what you typically want to have is to have some initial filter to screen out structures that are actually relevant or likely to be relevant for further evaluation. Um, and what, how, how that is typically being done nowadays is that you basically use heuristics uh, or element-based heuristics for, for uh, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> you use element-based, you use heuristics for substituting elements in already known crystal structures where you, you have some heuristics where you basically um, calculate, the pro uh, you have the probability of changing one element to another would likely yield something that is stable. Um, and then you do the DFT calculations for that. However, this tends to, it works, but it only has a generally a hit rate of finding around 10 of the 15% of the structures that are suggested are actually uh, uh, new stable structures. So what I'm gonna talk a little bit instead about using energy-based machine learning models for accelerating the screening. So, so if you would use a machine learning model that is trained to predict formation energies for crystal structures and <clears throat> to see uh, if such a model can help improve the screening. And the question is then what kind of machine learning model would you need, would you use for this kind of task? So there is a, you need to have the right tool for the job essentially. And <clears throat> But before I go in a little bit for, into what model you would use, I will quickly talk about the convex hull of stability, which is essentially one of the first or, or initial measures you use to assess whether a crystal structure is thermodynamically stable or not. And the convex hull of stability is essentially, we have one here for, for just a toy system where you, or, or a binary toy system where you have consisting of two elements, one element A and one element B. And <clears throat> you basically then plot the formation energy of your crystal structure versus the ratio of elements in, in, the, in the, the crystal structure. And then what you do to get the convex hole is you basically take the lowest lying, the crystal structures that has the lowest lying energy, and then you draw a line between them, you do a linear interpolation between them. And this, this hull is then known as the convex hull. And basically, <clears throat> any crystal structure that lies above this convex hull of energy is very unlikely to be stable. So it will likely decompose to a linear combination of the two neighboring um, crystal structure that lies on the convex hull. And if you would find something new that lies below the convex hull, then you, you have a, something that might be interesting, it could be actually made. And of course, you need to do further stability analysis, such as analyzing its phono spectra, or distorting the structure and so on, but I won't go into any details um, <clears throat> on this in this talk. But, the question is then, what is the best representation for this kind of job? So in this talk, I will not focus on any specific representation in the beginning and rather talk about different levels of coarse graining of representations. So with, with coarse graining, I mean how much information you include in the model. And I will talk about anything ranging from full atomistic, atomistic representations that contain full coordinate information 
to representations that contain essentially no structural information, so only containing the composition of the system. But before I go into crystals, I will just briefly talk about representations for molecule because it's a slightly more developed field. So what we have here is essentially hierarchy of, wait, sorry, the pointer is a bit weird. Um, hierarchy of representations for molecules where the higher up you go, the higher resolution you have for your representation. And in the top, you have this coordinate based, based representation that essentially encodes your system using the exact coordinates of the system and, and typically encodes all atom positions. And on the second hierarchy, you have this graph based representation, which uses either something like molecular graphs or bonds or smiles to encode your structures. And there is, and on the last, the lowest here, you have these representations that doesn't contain essentially any chemical or any structural information directly. So it only uh, contains chemical properties such as the dipole moment of your molecule, or partial charges in the molecule or composition of the molecule. Um, and, <clears throat> Yeah, similar, you can draw this kind of graph for materials where you would have on the top, you would have similar coordinate based representations of your material. And on the second tier, you would have something like a graph or prototype based. So you would use some pro crystal prototypes to encode your structure. And in the bottom tier, you have these composition based models. So the question is then, which model would work best in high throughput screening? Or, or which kind of representation would you use in a high throughput screening settings? So let's begin by looking at coordinate based representations. And as you can see in this figure taken from a review paper by Felix Misley et al, um, they are a lot of different representations. So in this paper, they actually characterized a lot, a lot of the, the, the currently developed representation, coordinate-based representations for machine learning. And it's a very well-developed field and there has anything ranging from, um, sorry, atom-centered distribution functions to potential fields to just encoding internal coordinates of your system. Um, and a lot of these tend to be very accurate and they also, most of these models, uh, coordinate-based representations has a high structural resolution, which makes them great for predicting structural properties such as dipole moments, forces, or energies. And they can be used to contract, construct interatomic potentials and force fields. So just some of the applications where these representations has been used are, for example, in simulating an amorphous materials, modeling grain boundaries in materials, and also for simulating polymers. And finally, they have also been used to predict the convex hull of stability for material structures uh, or for crystal structures. Um, <clears throat> however, and yeah, so, so this is what we're interested in. However, there is a slight caveat with using these coordinate based models for predicting crystal structures. Um, and that is typically what people have done in literature is that when they predict the energy of a crystal is that they use the relaxed crystal structure to predict the energy. Now you can get very good, good accuracy with the model doing this. However, to, to use, to get the relaxed crystal structure, you would need to do the DFT calculation in the first place. And as we can see from this high throughput screening uh, diagram, then you want to do the DFT calculation after the ML screening because otherwise the point is a little bit moot. So you have like a circular problem where you need the structure, um, sorry, you need a structure to predict the, <coughs> the energy, but that makes you, and for that you need a DFT calculation as well. So I would say that this is a little bit cheating, um, but what you could do instead is for example, you could, use a, if you would have a good enough coordinate based machine learning model, you could either relax your crystal structure back uh, into the relaxed state with the machine learning model. However, I don't think the field is developed enough to have um, coordinate based 
models that can do this across a very diverse chemical space. And then finally, what you could do, and people have tried, is to use unrelaxed crystal structures to predict relaxed energies. However, as I will show later on, this tends to reduce the performance quite a lot. <clears throat> so the, I don't think the, these coordinate-based models are therefore really ideal for doing these kind of, uh, for using as a filter in these high throughput screening uh, setups. So what about composition-based models? I mean, they're generally, since you typically just encode the composition of your, your, your crystal structure, that makes them very easy to customize to a specific task you're interested in. They're easy to, to interpret as well because they're so simple. And they're also very efficient in the low data limit because of that. And however, uh, yeah, and sorry, <laughs> there, and there has been a lot of models that has been developed for this task already uh, in literature, where you have model, uh, several different machine learning frameworks and representations to, that uses compositions to uh, predict formation energies for crystal structures. Uh, however, it has some problems when you only use the composition and it's mainly that the representation itself is not unique. So, for example, as you can see here, you can have multiple crystals that has the same composition, but completely different energies. And one way to solve it that people typically do is to just remove these crystal structures from the, the you just pick the lowest lying crystal structure. Uh, to train the model on. However, even if you do this, you can have non-unique compositions that lies very close to each other. So you can get very, you get a very rough surface to actually interpolate, which makes it difficult for the model. Nevertheless, as you can see in this learning curve here, where you essentially had trained, there's a model trained on the OQMD data set that I mentioned earlier, where you have the mean absolute error plotted against the number of training sample um, the model has been trained on for several dis different composition-based models, you can see that the error consistently goes down when you increase the training set size and they achieve actually quite low errors. So how do these models then perform for actually classifying structures that lie below the convex hole? So as was found in the review paper by um, Bartlett et al, where they try to do a critical assessment of how well these models actually work, they found that they are quite good at classifying structures that lie above the convex hole, but actually very poor at um, predicting structures that lie below the convex hole. So they, they could barely find any new interesting crystal structures or new stable structures, sorry. And so what we have, in, so what they did is they, in these figures, they excluded a uh, lithium manganese uh, transition metal oxides from the training uh, of the models. And then they tried to use these models to predict the convex hole uh, energies. <clears throat> and so what we have in these figures here is that you have the models predicted energy from the, the, the models predicted distance from the convex hole plotted versus the actual distance from the convex hole. And you would basically want your model to, the model's predictions to lie either in this, the top box or the bottom box, um, because that's when it gives a correct classification whether it's stable or not. And as you can see that all the models correctly classify structures above the hole, but at the same time, all of them are almost uh, failing for almost all crystal structures to classify ones that correctly lies below the hole. Um, so, and, and in addition to, to this, that even if you would have a machine learning model that is composition-based that could correctly classify structures that lie on the convex hole of stability, you have a uniqueness problem that you have to realize the crystal structure again after you have the from the composition but many compositions can have many different crystal structures uh, 
corresponding many different corresponding crystal structures. So you would then have to screen a bunch of different crystal structures to actually find the one that lies on the convex home. And yeah, so I would say that what you would need to do this kind of task is some kind of graph or prototype based representation, which, and you would need this representation to have a sufficient resolution to actually be able to reconstruct the crystal structure from the representation itself. And also you want at the same time to be coarse grained enough to avoid, um, so, so that it has the same re representation when you train it on, on unrelaxed and relaxed crystal structures. And yeah, so, I, but there is barely any focus on this in, in, in the, or there, there are barely any representations for, that, for materials that lie in this class. So I think this class of <laughs> representations needs a lot more focus. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, I'm, I think I can take some questions now if there are any, because then I will move on to talk about my research. Oh yeah. Yeah. Hello. Nice talk. Uh, the question that I have actually, I mean, I'm not quite sure how you came up with the number of 10 to 15 percent heat rate Sorry. when you talk about the suitable substitution in the slide with this, like when you have some structure and then you replace with suitable some kind of silicon to germany or uh, things like that. Go back, go back, go back. Very initial one. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, this one. Yeah. Yeah, so, so 10 to 15 percent heat rate. What do you mean by that? Will um, you please like this? Is just what when when they use these heuristics for um, I, I will get to that a little bit later because there is a data set that we will talk oh, okay. about in the research where they actually use this kind of heuristics to uh, simulate the materials workflow, the same materials workflow that materials project is using, and they find that with this workflow, they have 15% um, of the structures that they find lie on a new convex hull of stability. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there has been some other research in literature as well on it. So, so they, typically these models has this kind of performance from what I know. Okay, thanks. And something else if I'm allowed to ask. So you talk about the resol resolution actually when it's about this like representation of the molecules or or about i mean like coordinations miles of chemical properties and in case of the other one graph theory, I mean, graph or composition based so my question is what you say when in case of a database somebody is combining both of them it's like in some part of the data i'll be using the structure atomic structure and in some of the cases or mix match of them so that it's not to demanding on the data set. Am I clear what I'm asking? I'm sorry, I'm not really following. So I was saying actually the resolution increases depending on what you choose from atomic structure to the composition based. Yeah. So do you think it's a possibility that if somebody wants to mix match between them? So it's use a mix between coordinate based and yeah, yeah, yeah. non-coordinate based. I mean, of course it can be done, I guess, but I'm not really sure. I haven't thought about really how you would do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, like the, the motivation. Because, yeah. Like, what, what would you, how, how do you suggest them that you would mix match it? Ooh, okay. I thought I would get an answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't be asking you questions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can talk about it. Yeah, we Thanks. can talk about it, Borov. Thanks. Kevin, do you have a question? One question from uh, online, whether you could specify whether this set of techniques is just for high throughput screening 
or could be applied more in general? Uh, specifically, which set of techniques? Uh, molecular systems or uh, compounds in general? Well, the cosmic system as broad as. You, you mean, I, I'm not still not sure exactly which technique you're talking about. Is, is it the, the representations or the DFT workflow? I mean, yeah, I think it's the same for molecules as well. You suffer from, it has the same issues when you train and predict on relaxed structures as well. Fantastic. Okay, one question here. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. So um, when you, you discussed how they, uh, if, if you go uh, next, um, they were comparing the, um, the prediction on structures on the convex hull uh, and above the convex hull. So uh, this looks like the classic problem when you have many more structures above the convex hull than on the convex hull. So it's a classic imbalanced data set uh, problem. Um, can, can you comment a bit on, on this? Like how did they address this in the, because it, when in your data itself, there's many more uh, negative cases than positive cases. Yeah. It's a bit natural that the model tends to go that way. Yeah, I mean, I guess they, I, I'm not sure if they've actually done any rebalancing of the model to, to, to weight it by its distance from the convex. So probably not in this case, which could maybe improve it slightly. Um, but I don't know exactly how, it, how they did it in this paper. Hello, thank you very much for the talk. So my question is, regarding of the representations. So is the uniqueness problem solved when we use a graph-based uh, representation? So the second step of your pyramid, let's say. Um, I mean, it depends on what you mean by uniqueness because like you wouldn't be able to use a, a coarse grain uh, representation to, to, to create a force field, for example, right? Because it doesn't have the... So what I had in mind is, for example, for, for materials, you mean? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if I have a molecule, I can have different conformers of the same molecule. Yeah. And in that case, uh, I should take in account, I don't know, do exist graph-based representation that take um, this in account? So it hasn't, there are a few, I will get to it as well. And my next talk will talk about such a representation uh, as well. So I, perhaps I will, will, I will answer your question soon. Okay, I look forward to that. Yeah, other questions? No oh, one over there. You're making me run, guys. Thanks for the presentation. So I have one point that I didn't understand uh, when you're talking about the coordinate-based uh, method. So could, could you go back to uh, that slide? Sorry, which? Yeah, this one. So yeah. I, I didn't get, I can understand that you need to do DFT to fulfill this circular, but why you need to, uh, the energy of the relax the structure? Because... I don't know, but because when you relax the structure with DFT, you get the energy off it anyway. Yeah, I mean, but uh, if you, you just need the uh, self consistent calculation to get uh, the energy of a random structure to fit your machine learning algorithm, right? So. Why, do, why does it need to be relaxed? Because when you relax it, it goes to the ground state. Right? No, but typically how you do these DFT calculations for crystal structures is that you do symmetry constrained uh, calculations. So you relax it only along the symmetry. But, and there you can even, in, for, in addition to that, you can be in a local minima if you relax it. So we'll, it won't relax into the ground state in most cases. Okay, thank you. Okay, I see no further questions right now. So I think you can continue with the second part and then we take more questions at the end. 
Yeah, so just to reiterate very quickly um, <clears throat> that on, on what representation you would use that the coordinate based representations are not unique, which makes them unsuitable and um, full <clears throat> structure based representations uh, suffer from this circular problem that you need to use the relaxed structure to in order to predict the energies. And we would want to have something, uh, wait, I don't think my, oh no, it's working, okay. Um, you would want to have something like a graph or prototype based representation. However, there hasn't been that much work on it in literature. And there are a few representations like using Voroni tessellations to encode your crystal structure. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about using the symmetry operations of your crystal to represent it. So you would use something called Wyckoff sequences. So we're in, in this, we have a, just a toy crystal structure here, with a 2D toy crystal, where with different atoms placed at different positions. And you essentially can encode your structure using which symmetry lines they lie on. So the cro yellow crosses would correspond to, for example, one symmetry position or one white position and one, <clears throat> the, these blue pentagons would correspond to another symmetry position and the red circles would correspond to another, yet another symmetry position. So you could then take these symmetry operations of your crystal structure and put them into a regressor to predict your energy. Um, and these tend to be very stable towards relaxing the crystal structure because generally the only way is for these crystal structure, uh, these representations to increase in, uh, or, or, sorry, to change symmetry is if it goes up into higher, more symmetric crystal structure, and that's relatively rare. Um, <clears throat> and just to go into a little bit more detail of how we actually do this representation or, or how we encode the atoms is that we use a, we encode the ele uh, element type using just a matte scholar embedding. So some embedding vector that encodes the elemental structure. And then we use, um, the part which encodes the, the atomic position, we have the, we encode the crystal system as well as it's bra, the, the Bravi centering of the crystal to encode the lattice itself. And then we use a multi hot embedding to encode the actual atoms position uh, on this lattice or in, on the crystal lattice. And then what we do is we pass this, uh, these Wyckoff representations into a, <clears throat> a graph attention network, which basically updates the embeddings for each of these atom <clears throat> based on all the other uh, atoms around them. And we call this, this framework, a, oh, sorry, a Wyckoff representation network. And then we use the output of this to predict the actual energy of the system. And what is very nice with this is that you can quite easily realize or get an unrelaxed crystal structure back from this representation. And it's completely enumerable. So it's very easy to search through your space. And in most cases, as I said, uh, these representations are unique. They are, we found some edge cases where you can construct symmetries uh, or crystal structures that you multiple crystal structures from one like of sequence, but in practice, this seems to only happen for very high energy crystal structures that lie above, far above the convex hole, which we're not very interested in anyway. And then, yeah, finally, you can do a DFT, uh, uh, DFT relaxation on the crystal structure to get the final structure you want. And so our work discovery workflow would then be that you start from a huge library of these enumerated Wyckoff positions. You then put the, oh, this got weird when I moved the slide eleven apparently, but anyway, so but you then, 
you put the, these um, crystal structures through this Bren model to get the formation energy of the crystals. And then you compare them to the current convex hull of stability, select the ones that lie below the convex hull of stability. You can reconstruct it in the crystal and then finally validate whether they actually lie below the current convex hull using DFT. And just at first, we looked at two different data sets to, 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 to see how this model performs. So one of them is this uh, is materials project, which is a very large database of crystal structures. Another one is this DBM data set where they essentially try to mimic this uh, a mimic materials project discovery workflow, but using a heuristic, the heuristic based substitution uh, method that I discussed earlier in the, the prior talk. And if we just look at the learning curves first, where we have uh, the mean absolute of the error of the model for out of sample data plotted against the number of uh, uh, number of training points, we can see that the error goes down. So the reason why we have two plots here is one is for just a single model and the other is we use uh, an ensemble of, uh, we train multiple models simultaneously we use an ensemble prediction. So we take the average prediction to get the actual energy, uh, but you can get very low errors. And what is perhaps more interesting than the error itself, because as you saw from these uh, composition-based methods that they can look like they get good error, but they actually don't perform very well. So what we instead look at is the error of the model plotted against its distance from the convex hole. So here we have four different models plotted against uh, the model error of four different models where they plotted against the distance, their distance to the convex hole. So we have the top, which is the Wren model, which is, is this model that we, I previously talked about. And then we have this Veroni tessellation, which is one of the other few coarse grain representations for crystal structures and CGCNN, which is a full uh, structure-based neural network for crystals. And then we have this cone here, basically corresponds to the difference between the mean absolute error and the convex hole distance. And the, you essentially want your model to be good inside this cone because the better it performs inside this cone, the more likely or, or the better it will be able to classify structures that actually lies uh, above or below the convex hole. And then it doesn't matter that much if it performs poorly outside of, uh, or far away from the cone because you will have structures that will not be stable or very unlikely to be stable anyway. And what we can first see is that all the models essentially have their lowest error inside this cone, which is, which is good, which is what we want. And the second thing is that we have the CGCNN model performs better, quite a bit better than the other models by quite, quite a substantial margin. However, if you then, this model is trained on relaxed structures. If you would then train it on the pre-relaxed structures, um, then the model error deteriorates quite substantially to this red curve here. And it actually becomes one of the worst performing models. Whereas if you look at the, <coughs> Uh, the Voroni-based model, which is, which is coarse grain, while it performs poorly compared to the other models initially, it doesn't change in performance much when you train it on pre-trained structures. And we, we actually also tried this for the REN model, but there were essentially no difference in performance when you trained it on, on pre-trained or, or, or relaxed structures. So that's why we only see one curve for it. So how well does the model then perform at actually classifying stable structures? So what we have here is basically a histogram, two histograms, um, I'm sorry, three histograms, four histograms, <laughs> where the red and green um, histograms corresponds to 
predictions that the model has predicted to lie below the convex hull. So these two and the orange and blue corresponds to what the model predicts to lie uh, above the convex hull. So then you have the, the, the green ones is that is true positive, so it correctly classifies them to lie below the convex hull. Yellow is false negatives, so it misses to classify them to lie below the convex hull. And red is false positive, so the model thinks they lie below the convex hull, but they actually don't lie below the convex hull. And the blue is true negative, so that model thinks they lie below the convex hull, but they actually don't. And what you can see here that unlike these stoichiometric based models, which manage to uh, barely capture any structure to lie below the convex hull, we do manage to capture a substantial portion of structures that actually lie. Oh, okay. Um, we actually managed to capture a bunch of structures that do lie below the convex hull, and it correctly classifies 38% of the structures. Uh, to lie below the current convex hole, which is more than 2.5% better than these heuristic models. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, what we did is that we wanted to see how would, how would this workflow work in a more prospective manner. So we essentially started from a bunch of initial structures and we did substitution of the, the elements in these crystal structures. And then we, Use the model to pre screen the energies and then actually calculated the D, uh, with DFT, validated the ones that the model predicted to be stable. So we started with roughly 415,000 structures, and then the model predicted 37,000 to actually lie below the convex hull of stability. And since we used an ensemble model, we could <coughs> actually get an uncertainty from the model. So if we would add it that we want the convex hull distance plus the uncertainty of the, the prediction to be below the convex hull, we ended up with around 5,700 structures. And after validation with the DFT, out of technical reasons, we only managed to finish uh, around 4,700. Uh, we found that 33% of these structures uh, or 33% of the completed calculations lie below the convex hole, which is still a big improvement. And finally, I just quickly say that we, we're working now to see if we can uh, do even more prospective uh, experiments with this model, where we're working to see if we can find, uh, we can optimize several properties simultaneously uh, by, by looking for interesting dielectric comp compounds, so which, which has applications in, for example, flash doors, CPUs, and, and, and RAMs. And what, you, what we're trying to optimize then is both the band gap of these models, uh, or band gap of the crystal structures, as well as their total dielectric compounds. And we're also collaborating with experimentalists to see if we can actually synthesize some of the compounds that the model suggests. And with that, I would just like to summarize that I've given just a very cursory overview over, of the representations uh, or how well they work in high throughput screening settings. And I think there needs to be a lot more focus on coarse gradient models for material screening. And I also discussed one of these coarse grain models that we have developed that can be used for these high throughput tasks. And yeah, finally, I would like to thank, uh, first of all, Rhys Goodall, who is the PhD student who did most of this, this work I just talked about. And then I would also thank Alpha Lee, which is my group leader in Cambridge. And and then finally, Richard Armiento and Abit, who are our collaborators from Linköping University. And you can find the paper, a preprint on the paper uh, through this QR code. Okay, thank you. So we have plenty of time for questions, if you have any. Let's see, uh, let's go here first. 
Thanks, Felix. Uh, very nice. And I just ask about the generator step. Um, how do you deal with the fact that most Wickoff sites have one or two degrees of freedom, right? So there's like a line you can put things on or a plane. How do you choose where on that line or plane to put things? Um, so typically, like what we found in practice is that they, there is only one minima along this line. So it will relax into the correct one. However, there were, there were some edge cases where it doesn't, uh, they, you can have multiple lin minimas, but this seems to be very rare. And generally we found them for mostly high, high energy structures. So it doesn't seem to form a big problem in practice. Can I just ask, could you go back a few slides to, yeah, one of the, uh, yeah, keep going back. Um, just want to ask, yeah, okay, stay there. So you see the bottom left picture there, say the yellow cross, right? Yeah. So, so that could be along that line. All four of them obviously move together, but you yeah, could yeah. move so it. Yeah, so for example, the, the yellow cross here would, could, yeah. would be along this line. The, the red circle um, would be along this line. And then you can even have planes, symmetry planes that the atoms could lie in. So this, this one would... would um, <clears throat> lie in in this plane so exactly so that the bottom left picture the yellow cross could move inside the circle of blues for example and i'm pretty sure that would then no no if you would move in into the blue part then it would break the symmetry so it would would correspond to a different structure ah okay that's no longer on that wake off site yeah you move inside the circle of blues but still on the diagonal uh yeah okay okay thanks Okay, we have a couple of questions from the Zoom chat. So one was on um, data set sizes and if there's a lower limit on the data set or the data size that you need. I guess that's hard to answer. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I think it depends really on, your, on what you want to solve with it. But I think the more data is always better for, especially for these neural network based models are generally quite data hungry. Whereas if you would use something like a random forest, they typically, you can get away with using less data. And the second question was on, so you talked about energy models, but what about models where you need a derivative, like strain or stress, how would you proceed then? Um, it's a good question. Um, I'm not sure by hand, I, I can't come up from my head exactly how we would solve it, because, but you, you might be able to encode it into the symmetry positions themselves, but I'm not sure how exactly. And, but what I've been mostly concerned is actually predicting whether crystal structures are stable or not, which, for which you need only the formation energy, since if it's not gonna be stable, uh, you're very are very unlikely to be able to make the crystal structure in the end. Nice talk again. And uh, if I if you can go back to this, okay, maybe we can ask from here. So can you just clear me one thing actually? What this symmetry uh, yeah. representing the Wyckoff is adding over, or what is the advantage of doing this way over coordination methods? The slide number thirty-two, I guess. So what it adds extra doing this symmetry way of other than coordinate based? Because you, you mean instead of using a coordinate based representation? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, be, because you, you, you don't have to relax your crystal structure. It, it, you, most of the cases you have the same representation when you use your, your um, for the relaxed and unrelaxed structure with mm -hmm. the symmetry operations. Whereas if you use a coordinate based model, you would have the representation can change quite substantially if you do relax the structure. Okay, so then to iterate over it. Sorry? Yeah, just to iterate this question. I mean, uh, when you have this coordinate based one, when I'm encoding this and also the symmetry one when you are encoding this. So is there any kind of generalizability that gets added when we are doing this? Symmetry one when we're encoding this is there really I mean, depends on what you mean by generalizability. So, 
I mean, like different structures and all these. If, if the model performs better in general, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I think if you train them on the relaxed structures, they, as I showed, they, they uh, non coordinate based model actually performs a lot better. Mm -hmm. But if you train them on the unrelaxed structures to predict the relaxed energies, they, the model performance of these coordinate based models uh, goes down quite a lot. Okay, and uh, on this slide, actually, what do you mean by pre-relaxed? Is like unrelaxed ones? So you use I don't I don't remember exactly how we did it, but it's a very cheap initial relaxation of the okay. crystal structure just to make sure that it's not something completely nonsensical. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if you just go to the database one where you were like moving down and the number of the database and the novel one. This one. No, no, no. For the for the. Uh, the the one with the database where you are like 33 percent of the one you will have at the end sorry the slide with the data number oh, yeah. yeah we're moving down and all this one no no next one yeah this okay so this one question may not make a lot of sense i'm just i'm just asking is like when you have start from these noble candidates they're like Four one five four two zero. Then you end up with one five five eight. And uh, since you talk about the new objects data set, and then you have substituted the new ones. So I just want you to comment over if we, I mean, delete some of the data set that already existed, and do this experiment. Do you think the the predicted the novel materials that you say in this case, in that way, will it be predicting the already existing one? Sorry, predict. Say that again. Uh, just say it's like we we take the data set up to 2012, yeah. okay, but we're living in 2020 and we do this same thing and we'll it be able to predict some of the ones that we already knew in 2020. What what will So be if you there? retrain it and try to do predictions again, you mean, yeah. I mean, I think the model or, or we did these experiments actually and the model performance becomes worse simply because there are less structures left that lie on the convex hole. So each time you would iterate this out, while the model gets better, there is also less possible candidates to, to find. Thanks. Okay, a quick question from Zoom. Um, so you showed a model for the band cap, right? And for the total energy. Is there anything else machine learning models can predict or these type of models can predict? Um, I, I mean, we've, this is what we have tried so far, but in principle, you should be able to apply them to, to predict any property you want. But then, I mean, I cannot say to how well the model will actually perform because that's generally something you just have to try to figure out. Uh, and uh, in this like workflow, in this slide, and uh, there's this like sigma value that you added to like decrease the number of candidates? Like how did you like really oh, yeah. decide the uh, value of Sigma? Or so like, so or this is basically, we, since we, for, for this workflow, we used an ensemble of neural networks. So we trained several models and the mean is then the energy prediction that we used, but you can also get a standard deviation, which is this Sigma. So it's basically some measure of how uncertain the models are, how much the different neural networks disagree with each other. Uh, you shifted it to like just by one. Yeah, yeah, so we, we uh, just said it. Center deviation of that. And, yeah. Okay. Okay, one more question. Hello. So I have a question about DFT part. When you say DFT, you mean what? You mean a periodic DFT or I don't know. So I mean, I think point. this is standard, uh, like uh, DDA PV, I think. Oh, okay, okay. So nice. it's, it's, we, we use VASP for these calculations. Okay, thank you. And do we have any other question on Zoom? No? Good, so we're a little bit early for the coffee break. That's good. Uh, 20, what was it, 20 minutes, half an hour? And then we have one more lecture this afternoon.
Uh, so please come back for that. Our lecture is already ready. Okay, so coffee break now. <laughs> <laughs>